The lights go out on Maple Street as a young woman takes stock of her marriage and the man she once thought she knew. She sits at the kitchen counter, absently stirring a cup of tea that went cold hours ago, but she just can't bring herself to stand and heat it back up. She glances at the baby monitor sitting next to her, grabs it, and holds it to her ear. Steady, peaceful breathing. The baby is fine. No one needs a thing from her right now. She stares at the seat across from her, where her husband sits every morning, sharing coffee and breakfast before they start the day. She glances at the clock. 8 p.m. He'll be home soon. She'll have to face him, have to find a way to look him in the eye, force a smile. Pretend she doesn't know that he's getting home two hours late from who knows where. The thought turns her stomach. It wasn't always like this. Their marriage wasn't always a tense charade, their home a haunted house. He was sweet that first year. He'd buy her flowers and take her out to dinner. He'd kiss her in the morning before they'd even brush their teeth. He wouldn't come home smelling like his secretary's perfume. But ever since the baby, something's been different. The light behind his eyes has gone dim. He won't help with late night feedings, won't change diapers. Most of the time, he acts as if the baby doesn't exist. His own son. He just comes home, stares vacantly at the TV, and expects her to handle everything without so much as a single complaint. She hasn't slept in weeks. She hasn't been down to her art studio in the basement in months. Then, a sound shakes her from her thoughts. She hears the unmistakable rumble of a car pulling into the driveway and fixes a stiff smile on her face. Maybe she'll leave him. Maybe tonight she'll work up the courage to say those words that will change everything. I want a divorce. The baby barely has a father now. What difference would it really make? The woman's husband stumbles through the door, lipstick on his collar and the smell of whiskey on his breath. He greets her with a kiss on the cheek, more out of obligation than anything else, and grabs himself a can of soda from the fridge. She offers him some stew from the stovetop. He brushes her off, saying, I already ate. She doesn't bother asking when or how, when he supposedly came straight home from work. There's no point. She knows he'll only lie. Do you want to say goodnight to the baby? She asks. It's a test, as she watches his face for any flicker of fatherly affection. Isn't it asleep by now? It. He calls their son, It. He's sleeping. But you could still go up and see him, if you're quiet. I had a long day. I'm tired. I'll see you in the morning. She can't help herself. Him. What was that? Him. He's not a thing. He's our child. He sets the can on the coffee table with a heavy clatter. Do you have to nitpick every word that comes out of my mouth? She deflates at the outburst. No. He sighs, shaking his head. Don't look at me like that. I can't stand when you stare at me like that. She averts her eyes, looking down. Fine. I'll go up and check on him. You enjoy your relaxation time. That's it. Tonight is the night. She's going to pack a bag tonight. She'll leave and start a new life, just her and her son. He won't even miss them when they're gone. It'll be better for everyone this way. She'll just go upstairs, check the baby, wait for him to fall asleep. Then she'll just cut and run. It's not like he deserves a proper goodbye from her. She can go away, go to her sister's place. As she fantasizes about leaving him, spending peaceful days in a little country house with her son and maybe a dog, she finds that the baby has spit up all over his pajamas. She scoops him up into her arms to make sure everything is okay otherwise, and he's fine, just a mess. As she holds him, he stirs awake and begins to cry. Oh, sweetheart, oh, I need to change you and give you a bath. Shh, sh it's okay, you're all right. What's wrong? Her husband's voice comes from the doorway, startling her. It doesn't concern you. She can't help herself. Her resentment creeps into her voice. He just needs a bath. What, you think I can't bathe my own son? He scoffs. That's it? Well, you haven't done it yet. So, when she turns to look at her husband, there are tears in his eyes. I'll do it now. Something in his voice is so sincere, she falters in her determination for a moment. Maybe he'll really try. Maybe things will go back to how they used to be. And she really, really needs a rest. So she hands the baby over to him and sits down in the soft chair in the corner of the nursery. Before too long, the exhaustion overcomes her and she nods off. In her sleep, she can't see her husband leaving the bathroom to go downstairs and catch the last 20 minutes of the Dodgers game, leaving the baby alone in the tub. When she stirs awake, the crib is still empty. She can hear the water running and she knows. She just knows what has happened, what she let happen. No what he did.
A glance into the bathroom confirms her suspicions, and with a primal scream of pain, rage, and heartbreak, she tears down the stairs to confront the murderer himself. She finds him asleep on the couch and takes a moment to catch her breath, to wipe the tears from her eyes. Did he do it by accident or on purpose to punish her, to free himself from their marriage once and for all, to break her heart beyond repair? It doesn't matter in the end. What's done is done, whether he meant it or not. But what can she do? What could ever make this right? She wants to scream, to set the house on fire, to tear him to shreds. Then she spots it. The baseball bat leaned against the wall by the door in case of an intruder. She picks it up, feeling the weight of the wood in her hands, the heft of it. Swung hard enough with real intent behind it, it could really do some damage. Slowly, thoughtfully, she walks back toward the couch, raises the bat, and swings. It only takes one good hit to get the job done, but she swings the bat a few more times anyway as something inside of her bends and bends and breaks. Until the tears stop falling, until her vision comes back and everything stops looking like a wash of red. He doesn't even scream, never wakes from his stupor to see the look on his wife's face when she gets her revenge. He's just gone. She wipes the red from her eyes and lets the bloodied bat drop to the floor. She started the day as a wife, as a mother, but now she's ending it as a killer. He deserved it, she tells herself. He took her baby from her, so she got him back. But why doesn't she feel any relief? Why does she still feel the gnawing grief in the pit of her stomach, feel the darkness clawing at her heart? First things first, she needs to get him out of the living room, out of sight of prying eyes and nosy neighbors. She could try to bury him, but where? The yard isn't exactly private, and she's not sure how much she could even dig up before sunrise. No, that won't do. Then the idea hits her, and she grabs him by the arms and begins dragging the lifeless body of the man she once loved toward the basement stairs. He's heavy, much heavier than she expected, but she supposed they called it dead weight for a reason. She grunts and struggles as she drags him down the stairs, wincing as his head bumps against the steps, before reminding herself he's not using it anymore. She surprises herself with a laugh, a dry sound echoing in the empty basement. She drags him past the last chair, and he lands on the floor with a thud in the room that she converted into her home art studio when they first bought the house, back when things were still good. Her eyes dart about the room, the half-finished paintings, the wood carvings she abandoned when she got pregnant, the paints and long dried out lumps of clay, the potter's wheel in the corner. Her eyes settle on a metal frame, large and twisted into a vaguely human shape. She had crafted it years ago, intending to cover it with concrete and paint it, but never got around to it. No, she had been forced to put it away. Her husband hadn't liked it, had thought it was creepy and odd, and didn't want her working with such heavy materials. Just another thing he took from her, another dream he destroyed. It's just about his size, now that she takes a look at it with him lying limply on the ground so close by. With a little bit of muscle, some determination, he would fit right inside, and there are the tubs of cement, still sealed tight and ready to mix, just as she left them. She could shove him into the frame, paint him with layer on layer of cement, and it would be like he had disappeared in the night. A fitting coffin for the man, she thought. The perfect place to hide him, too. No one would ever know. No bones to dig up in the garden out back, no smell of rot seeping out from beneath the floorboard. She smiled to herself, just a little bit. In death, her husband would help her finish her greatest work. She didn't consider herself a wife or a mother, not anymore, but she was still an artist, and he would be her art. As she mixes the cement, she hums a little song to herself, beginning to feel something like peace. Everything is ruined, her life as she knew it completely turned upside down, but she is here in the art studio, creating again. Not a waste of time now, is it? She remarks to her husband's body. He doesn't answer. Typical. Why get an art degree, you said? Well, it prepared me for this, didn't it? I wonder what I'll do with you when you're done. Maybe I'll keep you down here. That seems like a waste. Maybe I'll get you displayed in a gallery. Let people buy tickets to take a look at you. You'll be my masterpiece. You'd hate that, wouldn't you? Me thriving, creating, all without you there to make snide comments and treat me like dirt. As she waits for the concrete to become usable, she turns her attention back to the metal frame. Time to put her ex-husband in his place. She lifts him and begins to wedge his body into the metal structure. 
He's heavy, getting heavier all the time, and left a trail of blood behind on the floor that she would have to clean up and bleach later, but after several sweaty minutes, he is in place. He looks correct to her, sitting there in the frame, ready to become something new, something different, something better than he ever was in life. The concrete is ready, and she begins to smooth it over the body and metal frame, flesh and blood, and sweat and grit, layer upon layer upon layer. Mix, smooth, wait, mix, smooth, wait. All the while she talks to him, weeps bitter tears into the concrete. At one point, she pricks her finger, her blood dripping into the mixture and becoming part of the sculpture. For days she carries on this way, not breaking to eat, bathe, or sleep. After three days pass, she runs out of concrete, but the sculpture is not finished. She'll need to go out and get more. She takes a shower, washing away the dust, the blood, and the guilt, changes into fresh, clean clothes, and takes a drive into town. She picks up more concrete first, telling the clerk some story about home improvements she's working on. He asks if she's married, if her husband will be helping with the work. I'm recently separated, she replies. On the way home, a small store catches her eye. It's a place she's driven by plenty of times, a little occult shop filled with herbs and tapered candles and strange leather-bound books. She isn't sure if she believes in this sort of thing, not really, but something makes her park and walk inside anyway. A gnarled old woman behind the counter spots her, and without speaking, points her toward a room in the back. It's different there, darker, filled with vials of thick, dark liquid, shelves full of skulls that might be human, though she isn't sure. In the back of the room, there is a bottle of paint, deep red and vibrant. What it's doing here, she couldn't be certain. But as soon as she sets eyes on it, she knows she needs to have it, needs to add it to her sculpture to make it truly complete. She brings it to the woman at the counter, but she just says, Take it, no charge. I can tell you really need it. Just be careful what you use it for. It's powerful stuff. She wants to ask what that means, what's so powerful about this little bottle of strange red paint, but she doesn't. She's much too exhausted and much too determined to get back home and put the finishing touches on her masterpiece. She drives straight home and hauls the concrete and paint inside, carrying it down into the basement. She's dizzy from hunger and lack of sleep, but she doesn't care. She has one singular vision right now, and she must see it carried out. She mixes more concrete and slathers the whole shape again, sculpting out the round, bulbous head, the arms at its sides, the legs and feet, the curve of the whole figure covered in thick gray sludge, in potential, a blank canvas. Before it dries, she opens the paint. It smells musty, rich, and somehow ancient. It clings to the bristles of her brush like a living thing and takes to the surface of the sculpture eagerly, spreading out as if of its own volition as she brushes it on evenly. She paints the whole thing, every inch of it. At first, it doesn't seem as if there will be enough paint to finish the job. But somehow, that little bottle coats the whole figure in deep, dark red. She looks down at her hands, stained just as brightly as they were when she swung that baseball bat. She looks back up at her creation, the amalgamation of the fear, the pain, the heartbreak, the pure, primal rage, and begins to cry. The tears fall freely into her palms, and without thinking, she smears them into the concrete and paint until they disappear into the art. Then, she takes a step back, watching it all dry. All of that work, all of that time, that great yawning chasm of loss. And this is what she has made of it. She loves it, and she hates it all at once. And she can't stop staring at the place where its eyes would be if it had them. She half expects to see something looking back. She shakes her head, looking down at the floor for a moment. Then, she hears the sound of stone and metal grinding together. Her gaze snaps back up and she sees that the sculpture has moved just a little, its head turned in her direction. In an instant, her husband's words come back to her, don't look at me like that. I can't stand when you stare at me like that. It couldn't be. She stares at it for a long time, her eyes watering from the effort. She blinks, her eyes open, and the sculpture is gone. There it is again, the grind of metal and stone against each other. Then, with the sound of bones snapping, everything went dark. Her hate, her vengeance, her desperate act of violence and creation, with a splash of the most unusual paint, led to the creation of a deadly masterpiece that would one day be known as SCP-173. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today.
Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-280, Eyes in the Dark, 